identification of genes um, uh, in, in crops, as well as the animal free food and replacement of petrochemicals. The event today has three parts to it. So we have an academic panel, a uh, startup pitch and an investor panel. And there will be five minute breaks in between, in between each of them and a Q&A session uh, for the audience throughout the startup pitches. So feel free to add your questions uh, to the Q&A box and the chair will read them out. And uh, one final thing to say that this is our, our first event. So we're really excited. We welcome any feedback and we really hope you enjoy it. I will now let uh, Desiree take over, who will be chairing the, the academic panel. Thank you very much. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Desiree. I'm a student at the Arkin Lab at UC Berkeley, uh, where I'm also studying electrical engineering and computer science. At the Arkin Lab, I work on a handful of topics ranging from phages in the gut microbiome to things like bringing bioengineering to missions on Mars, which is uh, just a really cool place and really interesting things to work on. I'm broadly interested in using computational tools to make it possible to engineer biology in the first place, which we aren't too good at yet. And I'm also the person behind the graphics for this event, um, including this Zoom background, which makes my hair look weird. Now, one thing I want to reiterate is for everyone in the audience or all our participants here to please leave questions in the Q&A. Um, from my experience of doing things from the participant side, um, I got really frustrated when the host like ignored most of the questions and eventually ran out of time for them. So I will do my best and make sure that there will be time to take a couple of questions from the Q&A. So um, feel free to fire away in the chat. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to have Natalia Krasnover of Newcastle, as well as Dan Nocera and Pam Silver of Harvard here for a panel today. So Natalia, can you tell us a bit about your work? Uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this uh, kind invitation and for uh, hosting this uh, this CD and Pablo. Uh, about me, um, well, I started, uh, I was always fascinated with uh, computers and biology, and in particular, the evolutionary theory. I started doing my undergraduates back in Argentina, and I discovered that there were several ways in which uh, one could bring computing and uh, biology together. For example, in fields such as uh, evolutionary algorithms or computational biology. I then uh, did a PhD in machine intelligence, and in particular, I used evolutionary computation for uh, solving problems in protein structure prediction and protein structure comparison. And then I did a postdoc at the theoretical chemistry group led by Jonathan Hurst in the University of Nottingham on structural bioinformatics. When, when I became a full professor, I uh, slightly changed my attention to, uh, on the one hand, nanotechnology and biotechnology for, as a potential uh, substrate for carrying out uh, computations. And the more I work at this interface between uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology, and computation, I realize that the three of them at their core are actually information sciences. And I think this somehow uh, 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 encapsulates my uh, scientific uh, worldview for this uh, discipline. Uh, I currently um, I currently lead the interdisciplinary computing and complex biosystems research group here in Newcastle, where we have a, a, a large number of uh, projects at the interface of uh, computing science and the life sciences. Uh, some of these projects are on uh, neuroinformatics. We have other colleagues that are doing, for example, verification and model checking of, um, of uh, 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 devices that you can implant in human bodies, for example, uh, pacemakers to ensure that they operate that they, in, in the right way. And of course, we have lots of projects in synthetic biology and DNA nanotechnology. Uh, one of the, of the things that keeps me uh, more busy uh, these days is a project called Portavolomic, which is funded by the EPSRC. And in that project, which is very interdisciplinary, we have um, uh, from social scientists to, uh, to, to, of course, people in computer science, but also uh, microbiologists, molecular biologists, uh, chemists. What we are trying to create is a virtual machine that you can run inside a cell. So it will be easier to port circuits engineered within one species into another species. 
anybody that has done synthetic biology knows that although we would like to be able to uh, to to move circuits from one place to another it's, it's never so straightforward there is lots of of a, a redesign and, and trial and error in the process. So we are trying to see whether we can use some abstractions that come from the field of computer science and whether there are ways of implementing those abstractions in vivo so to make the engineering of biology a little bit easier. Uh, and the other project that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really very excited about is a, a project funded by the Royal Academy of Science where what we are trying to create are in vivo data structures by bringing together um, um, uh, DNA nanotechnology, in particular DNA and RNA uh, origami and DNA strand displacement systems uh, to build molecular data structures inside uh, living cells. And to do that, we use a lot of uh, uh, simulation and computer aided design to help in the process of, uh, of doing that. That's very cool. And yeah, I'm really excited to hear that you're at this intersection of computer science and all these other information technologies. And especially because that is what I'm majoring in. Um, Dan, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, it's, uh, first, it's nice to be back with the SynBio group at Oxford and then many others beyond. Uh, we had a fun time in the fall together. Um, I'm the, I'm Daniel Nosser, I'm the, uh, Patterson Rockwood Professor of Energy at Harvard. And I've spent my whole life uh, in the energy game. And I'm gonna mention, if you're interested in this, and we've had, I've had startups and they've gone to commercialization, but there's something really important to do. And I know this is a startup focused symposium, is to actually think you, you almost have to take your head and divide it into two worlds. So what are the two worlds? The first world is the one most of you are living in, the wealthy part of the world. And the only way you can go to market quickly with an ROI when you have investors behind you it, who want ROI right away, even if they say they don't, um, is you have to basically piggyback to an existing technology and make it renewable. <clears throat> That's the only way to penetrate. So I'm gonna give you one example. Many years ago, I invented this technology called the artificial leaf, where you could just literally take in a wafer, put it in water, hold it up to the window and it split water to hydrogen and oxygen. The problem there is if you wanna use hydrogen as a fuel, what happens to investors? They start saying, well, that's great, no, sir. You're making hydrogen cheaply. We were making it very cheaply, but now you have to convince the entire world and put a hydrogen infrastructure in place. And then all of a sudden the investors <clears throat> all run the other direction because they're not gonna wait for the world to have a hydrogen infrastructure. So in that, and that's an example of a roadblock you can run into. What we did is we reverse engineered the artificial leaf to say it should never split water. That allowed us to put compounds in water and put electricity in the compounds. And we made the world a, a flow battery and it worked really well. It can, and that flow battery was purchased by Lockheed Martin and so I'm in outside of Boston, 20 miles north of here is a 120,000 square foot facility owned by Lockheed Martin. And they're literally churning out these flow batteries. Now, how does that interface with an existing world? Right now, if you use renewables, you can't store it very easily. Batteries are a possibility, but you don't wanna have a battery in your basement that you're taking care of. So, the way this flow battery will work is at 10 to 100 megawatts sitting at the power company floor, the electricity you generate in your home, you can use the current infrastructure, send it back to the power company, put it in the flow battery, and then they can store it and then at night send it back. And what's really interesting about that from a cost model is all of a sudden, if you own a solar panel on your roof, you're generating energy for a power company that can commercialize it. So it also helps penetrate the market for solar panels 
because now the power company will pay for your solar panel and then they'll end up putting the cost of that over 20 years into the price of your buyback at night of their electricity. And so that's an example where you, we did something for the rich part of the world and you're able to interface to it. Now, is that where my passion is? The answer is no. My passion is in the poor parts of the world. And it's, there's a very easy reason for this. If you look at the world right now, 3 billion people hardly use any energy. And in the next 30 years, there will be 3 billion new people visiting the face of the planet, mostly in the continent of Africa. And they're coming into the parts of the world without energy. So if you're worrying about climate change, you should be worried about how are you going to give 6 billion people in poorer parts of the world energy. And this now brings me to biology because the constraint we put on ourselves is you could only use things around you that the poor have access to. And I'm gonna give you three of them, sunlight, air, and water, and it's dirty water, any water source. And if you start thinking like that, that lends you, leads you right away to photosynthesis. That's what photosynthesis does. It uses sunlight, carbon dioxide from the air and water, and it builds the world around you. So a few years ago, I was at MIT most of my life. I moved to Harvard and met your next speaker, Pam Silver, my friend and collaborator. And we started thinking about how to use sunlight, air, and water to do something like make fuels. And that leads you right to synthetic biology, as a lot of you know. You can take bugs that breathe in carbon dioxide. They can take sunlight. We give them hydrogen from solar water splitting from my artificial leaf, and you can make fuels. Now, at that time, Pam and I did that in 2016. Investors came out of the woodwork and wanted me to start a company and Pam to start a company, and they wanted us to do it in fuels. And here you go with the problem of an existing infrastructure. You, this world has spent multi-trillions of dollars to build their current energy infrastructure, and that's to take oil and carbon out of the ground and give it to you. If you think you're going to invent anything that's going to supplant a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure with your invention, you're crazy. It's just not going to happen. And so we put that on hold. But one thing we did realize is the bug we used to fix carbon was a single bug to fix carbon. If you then take the next step and take a bug that fixes carbon and nitrogen, then you can do solar water splitting use carbon as an energy supply to a bug and then let that bug draw on the internal energy supply and fix nitrogen, that's also in air, and you can make a, fertil a fertilizer. And that's worked out extremely well and that's a current market, an organic fertilization company. And so that started, it's called Kula Bio and you'll hear about it, I think in the next session, I won't wanna go there. But the important thing here, even with the carbon, is that the biology, by interfacing the inorganic piece, the water splitting to the biology, allows you to do distributed fuel and food production, especially for the poor. And now I just want to end by telling you why is biology so important. I'm a chemist. I make catalysts and do everything abiological. There's three things you can't do with chemistry very well. One is you can't take lots of protons and electrons and couple them to make a fuel. So in water splitting, I spent my whole life to do a four electron, four proton problem. To make a fuel, like say gasoline, you need 50 protons and 50 electrons. Chemistry and engineering is lousy at that. Biology has figured out how to do this intricate dance of coupling protons and electrons. And that's what you need to do for any energy or fertilizer production. The second thing is that science is lousy at making carbon-carbon bonds or any bonds. If you look at the last 10 Nobel Prizes in chemistry, there's three or four of them just to make a carbon-nitrogen bond or a carbon-carbon bond. Can you believe it? Biology does that all the time. So biology wins out over any engineering physical science because it can do massive amounts of protons and electrons and make carbon-carbon bond. And then the third thing is it can do it selectively. So that has been my interest in biology. Uh, we call it hybrid inorganic biological systems. 
Uh, I just mentioned fuels, but as you'll hear from the next speaker, Pam, she even thinks more broadly, you can just think of it as a general manufacturing platform, which a lot of you have thought about. So um, that's sort of my preamble. Um, I want you to think about what I said. You, I see too often, even in startups, that they've been, they think one thing they're doing solves the energy problem and it doesn't. You really need to decide, are you going to go for the poor parts of the world without an infrastructure or the rich parts of the world with an infrastructure? And it leads to lots of interesting new problems. So that's it, Desiree. Thanks, Dan, for all that insight. Pam, I'm curious, um, what are your follow-ups to those? Well, I want to first say thanks to Dan for uh, articulating that biology is a great chemist. Um, and he really captured that. Um, by way of background, I'm uh, a professor in the systems biology department at Harvard. And I want to say that Dan and I collaborate in what has possibly been the most exciting project I've done. And we are extreme distances apart on two campuses, but it shows that in fact, you can still come together. And that was even before Zoom. Um, uh, so I began the first half of my scientific life as a molecular biologist and a cell biologist. Um, I worked at a cancer institute and um, I, I felt a social responsibility to do something for cancer. So I developed um, what has now become a set of FDA approved um, drugs for, for cancer. Um, that was part of a, a startup company that is now um, uh, traded on, on the New York Stock Exchange and it's been a big success. So I had that experience, um, which is really more in pharma, but about 15 or so years ago or more, I, I decided um, that it was time to really pivot my research. Um, and I had some of the similar passions Dan had about really looking at trying to solve real world problems that weren't exclusive to um, the elite populations or the, the so-called coastal elites that we live in. And I had the good fortune um, to be asked to join a group of bioengineers and um, computer scientists actually who were at MIT. And I was the token biologist in that group. And we formed what we called the Synthetic Biology Working Group where we really articulated the question of why can't biology be faster, cheaper, and more predictable to engineer. We made a roadmap and we were gratified to look back and see that our we've actually accomplished much of what we included in that roadmap 15 years ago. Now, as to my own work, I, I also, I, I felt like we had this huge knowledge of biology that we have accumulated over 50 more years of molecular biology. In particular, I just want to shout out for bacteria. Boy, we really understand how certain bacteria work, like E. coli. And I'd be willing to say that we could engineer almost anything in E. coli, and we can also transfer that knowledge to other bacteria. Although I want to make a case that another thing you should all be thinking about is engineering new kinds of organisms. And I think that's a big space to get into. Um, as to our own work in this space of sustainability, um, we've done a lot of different things. We've um, engineered commodity pr production in photosynthetic bacteria. Um, we've developed ways to sustainably track food, which is a really important component of the, the food chain. Um, We've developed ways to engineer organisms so they can be safely released. And I think that's a big issue that we, we all wanna confront if we're gonna use organisms in the environment. We, we can, and we should do that safely. Um, we're engineering commodity production through gas fermentation, as, as Dan mentioned, um, engineering marine organisms. So the ocean is, is an amazing place. It's full of great stuff. Um, and so we've had a, a little bit of a contribution in really exploring new organisms for the 
for the ocean, I want to just make a shout out for um, some recent work, not from our group, about engineering uh, coral, because um, I think I'm really passionate also about strategies that will not only help the developing world, but help save the environment. Um, and uh, we develop bacteria that can eat and sequester metals. They can be used as organic miners. Um, and, and again, and then this idea of working at the biological inorganic interface has been absolutely fascinating and just been thrilling to um, be able to interface with Dan on this. And I just wanna tell a brief story about how that came about. Um, and it does relate to hydrogen, as Dan mentioned. Uh, I was trying to engineer photosynthetic bacteria that would produce hydrogen. Um, that was kind of going nowhere. It may even violate the laws of thermodynamics. But um, I, I also suffered from the, my own uh, naivety about scalability, which Dan mentioned, and I learned the hard way. Um, but the, then when we got together and we realized that we could use the hydrogen to then feed any bacteria that can consume hydrogen and fix CO2, then we have a back end for essentially storing the hydrogen, using the hydrogen that Dan's beautiful system generated and then programming the bacteria to make whatever we want. And the versatility of what you can make with microbes is huge. Uh, for example, fatty acids, sugars. Um, and we have startups in a number of these spaces. But I, I wanna back out for a moment and, and just say, look, we are, biology is the technology of this century. And the bioeconomy is the thing. This is what is going to make the world a place for twice as many people is the engineering of biology and the bioeconomy. And there are so many different angles on that. We need workforce training. We need uh, more predictability, which you heard about. We need more ideas and more imagination. We need to address issues of scalability. We need to address issues of investing, et cetera. So I'm super excited to be part of this growing bioeconomy. So that's, those are my thoughts for the moment. Yeah, thanks, Pam, and thanks, everyone. I had one question to kick things off on the behalf of this event being geared more towards students or people trying to get into this space. And my question is that, do you have any advice or even words of caution for people who are learning about synthetic biology and sustainability for the first time? Like, is there anything you wish you knew when you were entering or in some cases, creating and establishing this field? That's for me, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's for everyone. Well, I tend to go into it. things, I'm a big risk taker, and, and maybe that's a downside is that I don't tend to overthink things. I, I, I just go for it, which, it, which may be kind of a downside. Uh, and, and, as, and in fact, I did get in the trap that Dan mentioned of the, the dreaded biofuels trap. Now I get it. Um, but uh, I think, so what, I, it's, hard, it's such a hard question to answer because we, we want to bring in so many, we want chemists, we want, we want biologists, we want computer scientists. And, but what I do see sometimes is that um, people are, everyone's excited about synthetic biology. They want to come work on it. The grad students, this is, it's, this is all great. I celebrate that. But I do think it helps to know some biology. And there is a, there's, there's sort of this school of thought that, oh, I can program biology just like I can a computer. That's a dream. But if you don't know any biology, and frankly, if you don't know any chemistry, <laughs> it's going to be tough going. And so I see sometimes because students and I'm not saying you have, you cannot learn everything, but you've got to talk to people. You've got to really consume everything you can around you um, to appreciate what, what goes on in biology and even just knowing the central dogma. Um, how's a protein made is useful. Just this basic stuff. You really should try to know. That's my thing, my thought. I'll let others chime in. 
Dan, Natalia, any thoughts on that? Well, um, I already told you about uh, being pragmatic and knowing targets. Um, since there's a lot of synthetic bio interest here, and a lot of times people put the word engineering there, and you really need to understand full systems. So here's what um, Pam mentioned, for instance, uh, organisms in the ocean. Let, let me show you how you can fall into a trap. And, and that's without understanding a full systems analysis of the science you're doing. I've seen paper after paper say, I'm going to use the ocean to sequester CO2. And what the idea here is whether you do it biologically or chemically or engineering is you're going to take calcium and magnesium ions in the ocean, combine them with CO2, that makes carbonate because you can make carbonate hydroxide plus CO2 makes carbonate and then calcium and magnesium, it makes rock and it falls to the bottom of the ocean. And I see lots of, this is, I'm just choosing one example, lots of papers on this. Now, what is dumb about that idea when you take a step back? And what's dumb about it is, where do you think calcium and magnesium ions come from in the ocean? They come from calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. They come from rock. So the way you get those ions into the ocean is you have to decompose the rock and release the CO2 to the atmosphere. And then what you're doing is taking the CO2 from the atmosphere, putting it back to the metal ions, whether you do it biologically or not, and make more rock. So you've done absolutely nothing except take a, a, a process and put a massive cost for just recycling CO2 through the atmosphere into the ocean. So that's one, one issue or one example of when you get into things, you should really take the time to understand and scale and then the full system. It doesn't mean you solve that problem, but I've seen too many scientists, actually, I've seen too many talks in front of investors talk about using, doing CO2 sequestration. And when you look at the full analysis, I always think, I hope no investor will be investing in this technology. And the people don't realize it because they look at everything from a micro, uh, a microscopic point of view. So it's not to be discouraging, but anything you do, you should take a step back and think about the full system and then what challenges you're up against. And that first, it will help you identify important science problems. And then if you are interested in commercialization or technology, it leads to a much faster path to uh, technology development if you do that upfront, okay? So that's my two cents. That's great. Your, your two cents today have been hitting the mark. And Natalio, um, I'm curious, did you have any words of advice? I think it um, uh, resonates a little bit with what uh, Pam was saying before. Uh, the stage that we, had, we are now in terms of uh, programming biology is similar to the stage we were in, the, in 1945, 1950s about programming computers. At that time, you need to be a physicist or at least an electronic engineer to actually be able to program uh, things. So there was no technology like we have to get uh, today in terms of uh, full stack uh, software development. So if anybody comes to uh, synthetic biology thinking that you will program it exactly as you would program a computer, well, it's not quite uh, that situation. We are many years uh, behind that. I do think, however, that things will move on. And at one point we will have an equivalent of a full stack system for programming biology. But right now, if you want to get into this uh, area, either you need to uh, start with the fundamentals as Pam suggested, or you need to be comfortable in your own skin uh, and, and being comfortable feeling a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome, working on a field which you don't know all the, all the fundamentals. And that's my case. I feel the imposter syndrome all the time. But what I do is uh, I work with uh, people that know, know what they do uh, in the fundamental biology things. Uh, you build interdisciplinary teams that complement each other, and then you move forward together. So I would say the, the sine qua non condition for working in this field is to be a, a, a willing to work with people in different disciplines. Thank you, Natalia. I articulate sort of a, a dichotomy 
and it's not one's right or wrong. I just want to illustrate it. So on one extreme, um, there are people who say, I'm going to build every possible iteration on something and get the one that works or use machine learning on those inter iterations, right? So that's, that's one extreme view, which is cool. And then I use from my own experience and, and others I'm sure have had the same experiences. For example, we were building a bacteria that could sense and remember inflammation in the gut. Because we're very, the gut is a great place for bacterial engineering. And so we did that very successfully. We built a so-called circuit that is the gift that keeps on giving. It works every time. And people say to me, so how many did you build? Did you build a hundred? Did you build a thousand? Did you build 10,000? And the answer is we built five <laughs> because we had this really 50 years worth of understanding to the molecular detail, how in that case, lambda phage works, which is probably the most understood system in all of biology. And, and so I, I just use that as an illustration of, of a dichotomy that I think the two should somehow find a space to meet in the middle. That's great. And I, to follow up on that one question I have is that if you had, if you had some sort of magic wand that you could wave and solve um, like one issue that you identify in the space of translating scientific discoveries and bringing them to society, like what would be the problem you would solve or what would you change about that? But you said magic wand? Yes, it, it doesn't have to be feasible. This would be my magic wand, that we had actually a strategy for- It would be a synthetic magic wand, right? <laughs> no, the, it would be an investment magic wand where investors actually understand the scope of the problem. And there was, to solve some of these big problems, you have to get beyond the ROI of four years. And so a lot of you may know, I had a very successful relationship in Sun Catalytics did with Mr. Ratan Tata of India. And it's because Mr. Tata invested with a long-term vision, not only for, for his company, but also for um, the people of India. And I'll just say the poor of the world. And it's really hard in, in the US to go to market because the, and this is the gap that you confront. The initial investors want a ROI, I understand that. And then there's the technology with big companies way over there. And there's this missing gap in between to carry the, the research through a technology that looks good enough to then commercialize. And so there's a solution to that. Um, it's actually something I did with SunCat and it's taught now in the School of Economics at Chicago. It's taught Harvard Business School. It's called an early partnership model. So what we did is with the startup stage, now this is gonna be hard for some of you to hear, you have to give up personal wealth. So I'm gonna put that right on the table. And what, what I did with Suncat is I set up an early partnership model with huge companies. And that was uh, Lockheed Martin, Siemens, and General Electric. And then I let them use what I had developed and let them kick the tires. And, what I, and here's the difference. I didn't try to go it alone. At that point, I said, I'm handing this off to the big company, which means I'm giving up the wealth of the company because I'm not letting it mature and develop. But that's why I went from a one centimeter flow battery cell to a 100 megawatt system. It's bigger than the building you're sitting in. And I did it under 10 years and I avoided the valley of death. And so you have to finally go home and say, are you really trying to solve a problem or do you want to make money. I'm not against either one, but you can't conflate the two. And when you're in these big problems, you need heavy lifting and you're not going to do it going it alone with your little startup company. Yeah, I really want to echo that. Um, and I kind of learned a lot from Dan in this space. I, another thing Dan advised, if I can say your words, Dan, was only start companies that, you're, that you really think are going to succeed. 
and don't try to do a million of them. And I think Dan's been really taught me to stay focused on the things that that are your passion and are, are going to work. Um, and to the point of, for example, we're doing a startup now that is based on some technology we've developed around uh, sustaining life under extreme conditions, which, and this can have applications all over the place, plants, space travel, uh, military. And I actually just said, look, I'm going to give this to somebody else to make it work. And it's been, and, and giving up that, that right to, to really control it from the beginning, it's been way better. And the feeling that it's actually going to work um, has been intellectually and and uh, seeing things come to fruition much better. So I really want to echo that aspect of for certain technologies that I think that's a really good idea. That's great. Natalia, was there any, um, if you had a magic wand, is there anything you would solve in translating these scientific discoveries to the world at large? Uh, if I had a magic wand, I will uh, bring a little bit of uh, American entrepreneurship culture, particularly in universities, to UK universities. I, I think we uh, we don't have nearly as um, dynamic an entrepreneurial culture in our universities. There are exceptions, of course, within the UK, uh, Imperial, UCL, but uh, the, the medium range universities like uh, Nottingham, Newcastle, uh, and this, I think um, they could do better. They could be better strategies for commercialization. Yeah, that I, I just really want to be, take up that point. Um, yes, I, I celebrate that and hope you get there. You should keep in mind that the universities have pivoted hugely in this space also in recent years. Uh, my first company, actually, the university showed zero interest in it. Um, so, which actually turned out to be a benefit for me. Um, they've pivoted because they're sort of following the success of places like Stanford that started this kind of process, you know, back in the 40s and developed Silicon Valley. And they're all trying to do it because they, they're desperate for money, right? And, um, and so, I'm sure you guys will catch on. It, it, the motivation, though, is, is not necessarily, oh, we're here to help you make great technology. It's financially driven. And yeah. Dan can choose to disagree with me if he wants, but that's my take. <laughs> yeah, then those are all great points. And I really appreciate like the global perspective we have here. Um, Actually, I want to qualify that with one thing though, because you're you're at UC, right? You're at UC Berkeley. Oh, yeah. So I do, rem I, I'm a child of the UC system and there used to be something, it probably still exists. It was called the patent fund. And this goes back to the sixties because UC Davis, when it began was an ag school and they held some of the most valuable patents in agriculture. And so then they used that money to put it back into the university wide. And so actually as a, as a grad student, I had support from the patent fund. I have no idea what happened to that, but it was um, an amazing thing. Yeah, that reminds me of how UC Davis made and like holds all the patents for strawberries or something. <laughs> and that's how they make their money. But as promised, I do want to get to a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, the first two are related to carbon capture technologies. Um, we probably know that there are a couple of carbon capture startups out there. So from your extensive experience with translating these solutions to industry, is there a tip you would give to early stage startups? And are there industries or investors who are most interested in carbon capture? I can answer some of this. Uh, yeah, I should tell you, uh, carbon capture is going to get a lot of investment in the future. And the reason is, and you'll, you can see it now in the news, a lot of these hedge funds are getting pressure to be green. And so that's driving investment. And I... In Kula Bio, you, you can talk to, the CEO will be on the next call, but a lot of our, 
there's as much investment in the carbon piece as there is in the agriculture piece, and it's just growing. And it's literally because these large hedge funds are under enormous uh, pressure in their portfolio to have carbon in it, a, a good carbon, not a bad carbon. And so you're going to see a lot of investment there. So that's good. Then you got to think about, I saw there's a bunch of questions about cyanobacteria. Um, I started out thinking like that in algae, but I've moved away from that. And I'll tell you why. And in that instance, every bacteria needs to see sunlight. If you think about it for the energy efficiency and for the carbon capture. And I've moved away from that. Uh, that is the reason why algae is having trouble getting a foothold for anything. It's really the cost of the reactor. You have to make sure that every organism gets a photon. And that's a hard thing to design by engineering. It's a high CapEx cost. So that's what Pam and I did. We got away from that by saying, we'll let the solar panel collect all the light. And I don't need every little organism to see light. And then we made we split water and stored it as hydrogen. And then these bacteria, their only food source is hydrogen. And so we separated the light capture piece, which is a much more doable technology from the biology piece. So the only thing I'll, I'll mention is, first, I think cyanobacteria have lots of great possibilities from a biology point of view. But then once you take a step beyond, you you have to start thinking about how in a cost effective way you can get light to every bacteria. Now there's lots of interesting designs and, and I've seen them all. And I mean, I, I was involved in the whole algae piece when it was starting, but it seems like uh, the algae or, or any light absorbing uh, organism is gonna confront this. Now, let me take one step back. That's in today's current market. If you start seeing carbon pricing, and maybe that's an, a good answer for you, Desiree, if I had a magic wand, it would be carbon pricing. Because once carbon is priced, there's a whole bunch of new technologies that become available that investors would then be willing to invest in. So uh, you gotta keep your eye on both sides of the ball. Uh, um, I think cyanobacteria become really viable technologically once there's carbon pricing. Without carbon pricing, you really should think about what the full systems cost will be. And I'll just tell you from my experience, it's getting light to every organism and have every organism connect, collect a photon. If they don't, you're just throwing away that energy. And at the end of the day, energy efficiency scales directly with cost. So. Yeah, that's exactly and that's why, we, too. And that's why we, we dropped cyanobacteria. They're highly, you know, we, we, we were half excited with their engineering ability. But um, again, once I met Dan, um, I realized that this was kind of a fool's errand. And um, especially for a, a lab like mine, um, and so I'm not gonna say don't work on cyanobacteria, they're scientifically fascinating. But um, for now, I think, I, I don't know if, they, and we actually had, there was investment in cyanobacteria back 10 years ago or so. I don't know where any of that went, I suspect nowhere. Even the algae companies, I think, ceased to exist for the most part. There was a time when, um, Big Oil was investing in algae, but of course that correlated with the time when uh, it correlates with the price of fuel when it's high, then they start looking at alternative fuel sources. Um, so there was a big effort, for example, at ExxonMobil research that was, that I think still goes on, but I think uh, again, that oscillates with, with the price. And, it, and then I think also, and I'm curious what Dan thinks about this, the announcement, of GM going to electric very soon. Um, yeah. So I'm sort of curious what- Yeah, know. I'll tell you about that. I don't believe it at all. And GM, <laughs> Why did I know you were gonna say that? <laughs> with the last president, GM was all in for oil and getting rid of fuel standards with this new president, all of a sudden they're gone. And by the, within three years, they'll be back. So don't, don't listen to GM. I mean, 
that I wish they would have be a principle. Well, the thing isn't 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 company. the thing with bio any kind of alternative fuel oscillates with the election cycle, right? Well, that's why you need carbon pricing. So I just want to tell there's many cyanobacteria questions, and I don't want to be discouraging. I think you need to be the foot soldier in getting all the science done. And I truly believe now I'm seeing it from through Cool of Bio. The pressure on these hedge funds are going to really drive carbon pricing. I really believe it. So by the time you're ready to go, I, I think within 10 years, you'll you'll see the type of pricing that will allow these technologies to start moving forward. And you have to put a lot of good science in before you get there. So I, I actually believe it's going to be okay. And it's going to be okay because of what's happening in the investor world right now. It's just that it's going to take a little bit of uh, time to catch up. And then, then cyanobacteria looks really interesting once there's a carbon price. Against no carbon price, it's going to be a long haul. But within 10 years, you guys are young. I'm... I'll be withered away. So I, I say, stay, you know, stay on course and, and hope, hopefully the timescales will coincide for you. That's great. And yeah, I don't know what I'll be doing in 10 years, but we do have um, a little under two minutes left. And to get another question in here, I just wanted um, to pick your brains a little about CO2 sequestration. We've talked a lot about cyanobacteria and like the biological aspect of this, but what do you feel about the potential of reduced C1 compounds like methanol or formate? Um, so here you can, this is a, I don't want to be, this would be a good freshman chemistry uh, question. Take the amount of CO2 we need to sequester from the air and then calculate how much stuff you're gonna make. So you're gonna be hundreds of miles deep in it because there's so much CO2. So that's what's always the challenge. So there's two pieces of this. Is it CO2 sequestration to a chemical commodity? Um, that's not gonna keep up with true CO2 sequestration. However, for instance, it's say you had cyanobacteria and you could make them grow quickly. And this is what you'll find out from Kula Bio. They can grow, you can think about it as fast agriculture. So photosynthesis operates at 1%. In the paper Pam and I published, we showed you could grow biomass at 10 times the efficiency of nature. So if you can start doing fast agriculture, and I think this is a huge area for synthetic biology, where you just have things replicating quickly. And the way we got to 10% is we offloaded the inefficiency of photosynthesis, which is the light harvesting to NADH. That we did with inorganic chemistry and materials chemistry. And then once the hydrogen got to the bacteria, it was really efficient at growing. And so if you can get to agriculture, and I'm just gonna make it general, fast agriculture, and not make a bug to make something, just breathe in huge amounts of carbon and do it at a high energy efficiency. I think that is a really, really viable way to start turning the cost of turning the CO2 to go negative where we pull lots of CO2 from the atmosphere. And so I think that's a huge opportunity for synthetic biology. Now, why am I saying that? The way that you do it now is with mechanical engineering and it's called passive or dynamic carbon capture from the air. The price curve for that is a thousand pounds per ton of CO2. When you start growing things like agriculture or bacteria just to have them grow fast, that puts you on a much, much smaller cost curve. So I'm, to answer the question, in the, in the one line, I'm totally excited about what synthetic biology can do for carbon ca capture, because you're going to yeah. be on a much lower cost curve than mechanical engineering. Yeah, and I see this as if you had to say, what's the grand challenge for synthetic biology? I think that's it. Uh, faster growing, whatever, more efficient photosynthesis. There was actually just today a paper about using um, m plants that grow faster, they're, they're not commercial plants, but then taking 
information from those plants and transporting it to commercially relevant plants, for example. So for me, this is the grand challenge for synthetic biology. Thank you, everyone. We are, um, we are up for our break, but I'm really glad that you joined us today, Natalia, Dan, and Pam. And Thank I'm you. sorry I didn't get to everyone's questions, but we're going to take a couple minutes for a break now. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Okay, um, so 
one more time, thank you everyone for joining today's evening when we are talking about um, how we can utilize biology to, and synthetic biology to secure the sustainability. Uh, I'm Miro Gasparek. I'm a second year PhD student of engineering science at the University of Oxford um, under the supervision of Professor Antonis Papakristadoulou and Professor Harrison Steele. And I'm working on at the interface of control engineering and synthetic biology. And my research is focused on design and analysis of complex gene circuits and design of microbial consortia. And apart from that, I'm a member of the committee at a Oxford University Synthetic Biology Society. And at Symbio Oxford, we represent the community of Oxford students who share a passion for synthetic biology. Um, we regularly meet, recently mostly online, and we try to promote Symbio um, at Oxford and in a wider region, uh, while also acting as the bridge between students and academics. And if you want to get in touch, please go to symbio-oxford.org and follow us on Twitter. So after this fantastic uh, panel with the world's leaders in engineering sustainability um, through synthetic biology, I think the time has come for the startup panel. So basically today we have um, kind of a small startup showcase Then we will have four startups giving a very brief pitches and perhaps this will kind of give us all inspiration and perhaps encourage us all to, to, to see in what way the young and maybe not so young entrepreneurs are thinking about uh, utilizing synthetic biology to solve problems related to sustainability. So basically what we are going to do, we will have these short presentations uh, of each startup, uh, starting with Basecamp Research, um, uh, then Kula Bio, Hoxton Farms, and Phytoform. And after each five minute presentation, we will basically have a five minute audience Q&A. So please feel free to write your questions to the chat and just for the housekeeping purposes, I will then read the questions aloud. Um, and uh, that's basically how you can ask and I'm uh, apologizing in advance if you won't get to all the questions because the time is limited. But um, I really hope that we will get some fascinating insights from our speakers and that we will also learn a lot about how we can make the world more sustainable. So um, I think I'd like to ask Basecamp Research to um, unmute themselves. Glenn, hi. And uh, yeah, and good to see you after some time. And please just um, feel free to um, share your screen and, uh, and basically kick us off. Great, thank you very much, Miro. And uh, just thumbs up, Miro, if you can see the, the screen, all right. Yeah, all is good, beautiful picture. Great, so uh, welcome. Thanks everyone for, for taking the time to, to listen to this and come to this event. I'm Glenn, um, I did my PhD at Imperial in Synthetic Biology. And since then I've started uh, Basecamp Research with my co-founder, Ollie, uh, in this, this lovely picture here. And so at Basecamp Research, we discover novel proteins from nature like places uh, like this picture you can see here. And why are we so excited about this? Well, it comes back to this kind of sustainable um, angle that if we're going to discover um, new solutions to a sustainable world, we really believe these are gonna be biological solutions. And at the core base of these kind of biological uh, solutions are these protein workhorses, of course. And so whether you're finding novel gene editing systems, clean manufacturing, drugs, waste remediation, these all ultimately can be done with proteins. And nature has a lot of these solutions already. And where we see a lot of excitement is with a lot of these new applications coming online with the bioeconomy and a lot of these new companies of which some will, will hear from today. Uh, coming on with these new applications where proteins from nature will be able to, to kind of help with uh, those solutions. And so the opportunity ahead of us is great. Less than 1% of all species on Earth have been identified, and, and even fewer than that have been uh, sequenced and understood at the genetic level. And so there remains this enormous undiscovered pool of undiscovered proteins that are particularly concentrated in remote locations. So here at Basecamp Research, we're really tapping into the Earth's oldest science experiment. This is 3 billion years of protein evolution that's been going on. And so if we believe that there are a lot of solutions out there in the world um, at the protein level to solve some of our grand challenges in sustainability, we've got to go and find them. 
And so we're building out our base discovery platform um, to do just this. And uh, it starts with exploration. We have to actually go out into the world and collect a lot of this data. You know, 99% of the data has yet to be discovered. And there is so much unexplored and unique ecosystems out there containing these, these novel proteins that we want to find. So we deploy our portable laboratory, which can go anywhere in the world, and it can start to access this genetic information at a really significant scale, collecting both genetic and uh, a lot of chemical and environmental metadata too. And it's pulling all of this together into a sort of data science that we can really start to have uh, a, a moving impact here. So at Basecamp Research, we really see biology itself as a data science um, where we're starting to see a trend now where increasingly complex computational algorithms are starting to come online and be developed. And when you combine that with the deep contextualized data bank of genetic material that we're collecting at Basecamp Research, you have this amazing deep resource um, to discover a novel sequence space, a novel protein sequence space um, for novel applications. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. Having spent the last few months um, really starting to scale our data collection capabilities, we're now in a position to start offering these novel proteins from novel sequence space um, from nature to some of these companies in the bioeconomy dealing with some of the most grand kind of sustainability challenges. And so that's what we do at Basecamp Research. We are discovering novel proteins from nature using exploration and data science to build this sustainable future that we're all craving here um, that is built on biology fundamentally. And so we've started to build out a fantastic team to do this. Uh, we've got our data science team with Philip and Pedro um, coming on board. And we've got the Dean, our biodiversity manager as well, who's dealing with all of these relationships and um, with the places that we go. So again, covering this exploration mixed with data science, uh, we think it's an enormously exciting prospect ahead of us. So just want to thank uh, Hummingbird for, for their support so far. They've been uh, fantastic to work with and a lot of fun. Um, and we're growing. So we have five positions open now. So if you, like us, believe that nature is more than just our inspiration and it is part of the solution, then come and join us. Uh, you can apply our website, basecamp-research.com. So thank you so much for listening. That was a very uh, quick whistle-stop tour of, of our company. And I really look forward to taking a couple of questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Glenn. So uh, first question probably would be, like, how would you set up a methodology to identify proteins and enzymes with completely new functions, like given that identifying them will require you to identify them for a function? And by the way, this is not my question, so I'm not taking credit for this. So Yeah, um, great. That, that's a great question. So, of course, we're starting with proteins with known function, but going to novel sequence space within that those classes of proteins. That's our first port of call. But of course, as more of these kind of computational biology algorithms come on where we can do more complex annotations, for example, um, structure based predictions, we can start to look at those convergent evolution um, kind of things that I, I suppose you're talking about there, where they've developed a novel solution uh, that's using a novel sequence. Um, and really by understanding kind of the whole sequence space of proteins in its kind of entirety, you can then start to kind of interpolate between protein designs um, in a much more kind of systematic way than, than otherwise possible. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then the other question would be, what is the most recondite place you are looking to explore? <laughs> That's, that's I'll have to get my dictionary out and look at recondite. Um, but I presume it means what's the most kind of wacky place we've been to. Uh, I can't really disclose where we've gone, but we've got some some amazingly interesting places that have been. And, and particularly because of this portable lab that we're doing, these are places that are completely unexplored at the genetic level. There's been no studies done in the places that we've gone. Um, and we're prioritizing those that have exceptionally high biodiversity. So it's uh, it's been incredibly exciting so far. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a very interesting question from Ravi Ramanathan, and now I can see the questions in Q&A, so please feel free to ask there. How do you address biodiversity regulations and laws? I think that's yeah, quite absolutely. an important one. No, this is something we take uh, really seriously and, and do, do a very proactive role in this. So uh, our biodiversity manager and dean has started uh, working on this and building out really tight relationships with a lot of these uh, governmental organizations, NGOs, and nature parks around the world. And it's something we're incredibly proud of, how we deal with uh, international and national regulations. Um, up front, so we don't collect any data unless it's completely compliant with all the ethical and moral standards uh, of around the world. And so we really want to be a sort of uh, a figurehead in this space for doing things ethically and morally and, and accessing genetic resources in the right kind of way. That is fantastic. And next we have a question from Eliška Koshova. I, I guess that would be like uh, 
Slovak pronunciation. How do you choose locations where to sequence? What are the criteria? Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So obviously we can't sequence every centimeter of the planet and kind of nor would we want to necessarily. Um, but we take a very data-driven approach. So we, we layer on top um, many different kind of metadata parameters, both that we collect or, and that we pull from um, public satellite resources, for example. Um, and we can layer them on top of each other. So we've got a prediction algorithm that predicts distribution of biodiversity around the world at the microbial level. And it's using that that we can be um, sort of smart with, with where we go in the world and, and prioritize those kind of places first. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Then we have a question from Noah. So do you plan to develop these products inside yourself or find them and then license them to other companies? Yeah, thanks, Noah, a great question. So at the start, we're, deep, we're building out this kind of partner-driven program. So working with customers who have this particularly deep need for novel sequence space um, in a particular enzyme class that they're working with. Um, so we're seeing that as a really exciting first moving place to go. But of course, the long-term vision of the company is to build out these internal products ourselves. And that's something we're particularly excited to start um, start doing very soon. Awesome. Then the question from Brian, is your platform only focusing on proteins or are you also capturing microbial plant data? Yeah, no, that, that again, a really great question there. So capturing everything at the DNA level means that uh, everything is kind of possible, right? I mean, every, everything that an organism does is captured at some level at, at the DNA point. So of course, we're starting with proteins. That's a great place for us to begin. But capturing all of this natural genetic diversity, um, a lot of things are open to us moving in the future. And so again, the longer term vision of the company is to move beyond just proteins and anything in the bioeconomy that is derived from nature, we ultimately want to help um, kind of bring that to market. So whether that's natural products, biosynthetic clusters, Symbio gene circuits, new promoters even, who knows? Um, but we're starting with proteins for now. Wonderful. I think we can take like two more. So um, I would take one from Anya, which is quite interesting. Do you see yourself as having a role in conservation as well, making sure there are still truly wild places left where there, these new proteins may, may be found? I love that question. That's really nice. Um, that's exactly our vision here. Um, beyond just the, the kind of uh, core science elements to it, it's uh, we, we see ourselves really as one of the first companies who truly benefits from protecting biodiversity. And so when this gets to a really, really significant scale, it's in our interest to actively protect biodiverse areas, right? Um, for as long as forests will be will be more valuable standing up than they will be cut down. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of governments will keep cutting them down. So if we can really demonstrate that there is key value in biodiversity um, and key kind of economic value in it, uh, we really, really hope that we can help protect it. Awesome. Um, well, and I think that this is about the time we have for the questions. So uh, thank you, everybody. And I'm sorry if we didn't have time to get through that. But, uh, you know, uh, feel free to, I think, contact Glenn on, on pretty much uh, basically at the email address where that they're sharing or like on social media, etc. So thank you so much, Glenn. It was very Thanks, fascinating. Man. Good luck. Cheers, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. So the next one would be Kula Bio. And uh, so just feel free to unmute yourself and basically uh, share the screen. Okay. I um, Can you unlock my video? Okay, let's see if we can do that. There we go. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you. Um, well, my name is Bill Brady. I am the um, founding CEO of Kula Bio. Um, and my partner at Kula Bio is Dr. Dan Nocera, who you, you heard in the last, uh, the last panel. Um, and we are a biologically derived nitrogen fertilizer company. Uh, we are located in Boston, just down the road from Harvard. Uh, and we started the company in the fall of 2018. Um, so let me, I'm going to show you a bit of what we do in a minute, but let me just tell you the problem that we're focused on first. So nitrogen, we all need nitrogen. Um, we need nitrogen to grow because it's a building block. Uh, it's an essential element in, in proteins, ultimately. And um, unfortunately, there's only enough natural nitrogen in the world to feed about half the population. The other half is fed with synthetic nitrogen, which was invented about 100 years ago 
by a couple of German scientists, Haber and Bosch, which was great. They allowed the uh, population to grow to the level it is today. The problem is the environmental footprint is incredibly bad. Four tons of CO2 produced for every ton of nitrogen and 50% of the nitrogen that's put on the ground runs off into our waterways. So we have a different approach. We have a biologically derived um, natural nitrogen fertilizer. So here's a, here's a description of what we do. We start with a naturally occurring microbe. We do not do genetic modification, but what we first do is uh, in our bioreactor, in goes the microbe, in goes water, and in goes nutrition, and we drive up the density, the microbial density of the microbe. When we get it to a certain point, um, we then cut the nutrition and we feed the microbe CO2 and hydrogen. And uh, the microbe then produces a carbon rich energy storage material uh, and effectively fattens itself up with a bunch of energy. So this is important because microbes in soil is not a new idea, but the issue has always been that the microbe don't live very long in the soil because they have to compete for energy, either compete with other microbes or borrow from the plant itself. And as a result, these microbes will live a matter of hours, maybe up to a day. With our energy strategy with the microbes and giving them the energy store, our microbes live two, two and a half weeks in the soil. All of a sudden, if the microbe is living two, two and a half weeks, it's producing a significant amount of nitrogen and at a cost that's competitive. So we fatten the microbes up and then from our bioreactor, the product goes into the soil. And when it's delivered to the soil, the microbe uh, uses that energy to express a nitro nitrogenase enzyme, which fixes nitrogen from the air and deposits it in the soil. Um, so that's the general mechanism that happens. Now, after the two, two and a half weeks that the microbe is feeding uh, nitrogen to the soil and it uses up its energy store, the microbe dies and essentially just becomes a source of carbon in the soil. One other interesting part about what we're doing, um, we have a very interesting carbon imp impact story here. Uh, on one hand, if you don't use synthetic Haber-Bosch nitrogen and you use our source of nitrogen, you avoid that four tons of CO2 for every ton of synthetic nit nitrogen that you would make. But also because of how we make um, the energy storing material in the microbe, we actually also store carbon and sequester it in the soil through our microbe. So you get a carbon sequestration as well as a carbon avoidance. So that's the story of how our, our microbe works. We, um, to date, we have done 10 farm trials on commercial farms. Um, and in each trial, we've replaced between 50 and 100% of synthetic nitrogen with equal or slightly better yields. Um, so we've had very consistent results. By the way, most people often ask me why 50%, why not just all 100%? And one of the reasons is when we were out with the farmers talking about our product, most farmers are very interested to try it and to use it but one of the things they said to us was, don't be surprised if we blend it with what we're doing today to mitigate our risk. So make sure your product is compatible with synthetic fertilizer. And so that's why we did a lot of the blending trials. Um, so 50 to 90% um, equal or slightly better yields. Uh, we operate 
four 100 liter bioreactors currently to supply all of these trials as well. Um, so that's, that's, our, uh, that's our primary story. In 2021, we are um, focused on a couple of critical things. One is driving up the microbial density of our product. Our product is a liquid. And so the higher the density, the less water we have to deal with, the better. So that's a key, um, a key area for us. Um, also, we're, we're also working on crop diversity um, going across many other crops. And then finally, um, one of the other areas we're working on is this idea of sequestering carbon in the microbes. We are working on a separate product from our nitrogen product, which we call Kula C for carbon. And the idea is, what if we didn't worry about nitrogen production, but we just packed as much carbon as we could into the microbes from direct air capture, pack the microbes with carbon, and then bury the microbes um, and sequester the carbon. And could we do that? at a much, much lower cost per ton of CO2 than some of the mechanical or chemical means today. Um, and so we have some very good initial, um, initial work on that, but that's gonna be another focus for us in 2021. So I think I'll stop there um, on my explanation of, of what we do, and I'd be happy to answer, um, answer questions. Yeah, so thank you so much. This was really fascinating. So we have a couple of questions. So the first one that I got actually in a chat was basically what are the main bottlenecks to adoption of the new technologies in agriculture? So this is kind of the wider framing question. Yeah, and it's actually, I think, the most important question um, because as you might have gathered from what I, what I described, we're making the product at 100 liter level. I mean, we still have to scale up, but it's it's at 100 liters, not bad. It works in the field, it's delivering nitrogen. But the biggest challenge for us is how do we get the farmer to say yes? And think about the farmer. I mean, the farmer every year borrows a bunch of money in the spring, plants their crop, plants their crop, and then kind of praise for the yield so that they can pay back those loans plus a little bit more at the end of the year. So farmers are very selective, very conservative about what they do. And they only will do one, maybe two changes per year. So, um, so that's a critical thing for us. We found being out in the field um, a couple things. One is it has to be really impactful. So if I was here telling you that we had a five or 10% um, synthetic nitrogen replacement, the farmer would just say, look, it's interesting, but it's just not worth it. So you have to have big impact and our 50 to 100% is big enough. The other thing is you have to fit into the farmer's infrastructure. They're not going to pay you any more money. They're not going to buy new capital. They're not going to do things differently. And since we're a liquid, we can fit into any liquid distribution system. Um, and then the last thing is that farmers have people they trust. And these are usually crop advisors, people they have bought their inputs from for years and years. Uh, it's probably not a bunch of people from Harvard that they're going to trust, but they're going to trust the, the people they, that they know. And so we are partnering with those people to help us distribute. So it's a complex question and it's a multifaceted, um, you have to have a multifaceted strategy, I think, to address it, but it's really, it's really critical. That's great. So I think next would be a question from Jake, which would be, is a single organism okay for all crops? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So. Um, one of the strengths of our approach to all of this um, that Dr. Nocera really in his lab put together over time is that 
the whole platform is really robust. So it's a very robust, naturally occurring microbe, not genetically modified. It's only one microbe. And as I described to you, our process is pretty straightforward as well. So, so yes, we have a single microbe. Um, and in fact, um, one of the strengths of our product, our microbe and our product is that we are plant agnostic. We're not plant specific. I think a lot of the other approaches you'll see in the industry are very plant soil specific. So remember our, our microbe grabs nitrogen from the air and deposits it in the soil, not attached to the plant. So because we deposit it in the soil and then the plant picks it up in the soil, it, we're plant agnostic. So, so yes, um, across, I guess we've done roughly 10 crops to date. And across those 10 crops, it's all been the same micro. Great. Um, I would take perhaps like two more questions. So one would be from Ravi. So do you have any other plans to expand to other geographies? And I would perhaps like extend it question by basically asking how robust is your micro with respect to like environmental conditions, like temperature, like kind of in how narrow the range of temperature in which your organism can function is? Um, yeah, so we're, um, we've had, um, we, we've had our, the farm trials I mentioned across a diverse set of, um, of soil types and a diverse set of geographies. Um, we've not exhausted all the geographies. Um, and I am sure at some point we're going to hit different pH, moisture, temperature conditions that might need some adjustments to our bug, but, um, but so far it's been pretty robust across uh, crop types, uh, pH, pH levels and temperature and moisture and moisture levels as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I would, I think we have an interesting question from, um, we have an interesting question from Fiona. So are there specific policies that would help you and your product to compete and be more widely taken up? Yeah. So, uh, of course, a price on carbon um, would be a great boost to us because we um, the synthetic uh, synthetic nitrogen would be penalized on that. We wouldn't. So, price on carbon would certainly help. The other thing is, you know, it's amazing to me, at least in the United States, fifty percent of the nitrogen that's put on the fields runs off, ends up in our waterways, and there's no regulation on that yet. Um, so that's a second area that would be critically important to us. There has been some movement in California um, where the, at the state level, they have 2023, 2024 goals to make drastic reductions in the amount of nitrogen that can be put on the soil. So I think those two things, the price on carbon and um, how much nitrogen you can put on your soil would, would be a real boost for us. But, but we're, trying to, we're trying to design the, the product, design the company without those, that external help. And then if we get it, it will just be a real boost to us. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, this was really fascinating. Thank you so much and all the best um, and good luck with uh, working on Kula Bio. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next we would basically have Hoxton Farms. So um, if basically you can stop uh, sharing the screen and awesome. So next we have um, Hoxton Farms. So Max, I think. So please just uh, feel free to share your screen and kick us off. Hi, can you see my screen, Miroslav? Yeah, all is great. great. Fantastic. Actually, Thank you. I can see that you're sharing, but uh, it doesn't show the, it doesn't show it doesn't show the slides. Uh huh. Yeah, I can see now. Now everything is cool. Good stuff. And you can still see them now? Yes. Good. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Max. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Hoxton Farm. So the world is hungry. Our appetite for meat is huge and it's only getting bigger. Global demand for meat will double by 2050. 
will eat 600 million tons of meat per year. The meat industry is worth more than a trillion dollars, but it's broken. It's killing us and it's killing the planet. And since the pandemic, food security is at an all time low. Intensive agriculture emits 15% of global greenhouse gas. It uses 30% of habitable land and fresh water. It consumes 85% of all antibiotics, and it's a huge source of animal-borne disease. What about plant-based alternatives? We know that demand is soaring, but they're still not good enough. They're missing one crucial ingredient, which is fat. The plant oils that the industry currently uses are a terrible substitute for animal fat. They taste bad, they have a low melting temperature, which makes them greasy, and they require huge amounts of land and water to grow, which has a huge environmental impact. We urgently need something better. Animal fats, on the other hand, are delicious, versatile, and functional. They're the key to real meat. Fat is magic. It's the most important sensory component of meat. Without fat, meat is dry and tasteless. Our in-house experiments have shown that adding only 10% animal fat to plant-based meat totally transforms the way it tastes. At Hoxton Farms, we grow real animal fat without the animals. It's the key to making plant-based meat that finally looks, cooks, and tastes just like the real thing. So here's how we do it. To make cultivated fat, we start by taking a harmless handful of stem cells from an animal. We grow them up in a cultivator, just like brewing beer, and a few weeks later we harvest delicious cultivated fat. We sell the fat to plant-based meat companies who combine it with plant protein to make amazing plant-based meat. It uses five times less land, emits five times less greenhouse gas, and consumes 20 times less water, all without harming animals. We're creating cultivated fat as a B2B ingredient for the plant-based meat industry. Cultivated fat will take plant-based meat far beyond sausages and burgers, unlocking a sustainable $400 billion industry that rivals traditional meat on every plate in every meal around the world. So we're taking plant-based meat from this to this, and we're doing it sustainably. We're trying to create a future where all the meat that we eat is a blend of plant-based protein and cultivated fat. What sets us apart is a unique combination of synthetic biology and powerful data science. We have a global agent-based model that simulates the way cells differentiate, mature, and accumulate fat in a bioreactor. What this means is that we can precisely customize the melting temperature, the taste, the nutritional value of the fat that we make, and we do it all while optimizing the entire process for the planet. So who are we? I'm Max. I have a PhD from Oxford in synthetic biology. Actually, I was on the Oxford Symbio Committee way back when, and I have two degrees from Cambridge. I've worked in biotech VC as well as Symbio and future food startups in the UK, Europe, and the States. My co founder, Ed, who's listening in tonight, is a mathematician and a machine learning engineer. He has master's degrees from Oxford and Imperial, and he spent four years using math to solve the toughest problems in industry. We've known each other since we were five years old. Things are moving really quickly here at Hoxton Farms. We'll soon have fat growing at our brand new lab in central London. We'll have some big news to share next week. And we're building an awesome, awesome team, which is why we're hiring now. We're looking for stem cell scientists, bioprocess engineers, and computational biologists. So if this sounds like you, please do get in touch. Let's get started. Um, here are our emails on the right-hand side. We would love to hear from you. And our jobs board is live at hopsonfarms.com slash careers. Thanks very much. Well, Max, this was fascinating. And we have a bunch of questions. So I think I'll start with the first one from Sarah, which is, what is the vegetarian or vegan community's take on it? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. It's one we get a lot. So um, the, the, the cultivated fat that we're producing um, is very likely to be vegetarian. Um, the vegetarian society in the UK who do the labeling have said as much. Um, and that makes sense. It's, uh, it's an animal derived product, just like uh, eggs or dairy. Although we'd say a lot, a lot more ethical and sustainable than either of those. Um, as an animal derived product, it's unlikely to be technically vegan, um, but that doesn't really matter a whole lot. 
And that's because if you look at the Beyond Burger, for example, the standout products in the um, plant-based meat category, 93% of people who buy Beyond Burgers also eat meat. Um, your customer here is not a diehard vegan. Um, it's uh, someone like you or me um, who is concerned about animal ethics, the planet, wants to eat something, something healthy, and they want something really tasty. So they're not too hung up on whether it's vegan or not. Great. Um, so I think the next question would be from Joe. How much complexity in fat structure does the system generate, or is it all effectively the same fats? Another, another great question, and a thing that we talk about a lot. Um, we have the capacity to generate all of the complexity uh, that biology produces in fat, and, and then some more. That's where the symbio comes in. So as you know, there are, um, there are thousands of different kinds of fat um, from uh, different species, different individuals of each species, but also different parts of the animal. And they all have um, you know, their own characteristics, uh, everything from melting temperature to binding properties to nutrition and taste which makes them suitable for different applications. But on top of that, the technology we're building allows us to customize fat. Uh, so we can do incredible things like um, changing the ratio of saturated to unsaturated fatty acids to make something like our fat more healthy, um, changing the taste, or even introducing novel fatty acids, which aren't normally found in nature. So we have, we have pretty exquisite control over the fat that we make. And that all comes from this incredible computational advantage that we have. Awesome. Um, I think I would take um, the question from Yash, which is with so many different types of fats required between each particular food product, how do you plan on making it commercially viable and how do you see it blending with fermentation derived proteins? Nice. So I'll answer the, the first question first. Um, which is essentially just because there are so many different kinds of fat, how would you focus on one? Now, there is so much excitement, there are so many fats we could focus on uh, that it's difficult to choose. But in fact, from a commercial perspective, it's not. Um, uh, there, are, there are relatively few fats which are found in most foods. Um, and commercially, that's where it makes sense to start. Um, there are, um, I won't share too many details about how we do that right now. Um, but suffice to say that we're creating a kind of fat that's really, really versatile um, and will make an incredible difference in uh, the vast majority of products that, that stand between us and this incredible future that we're trying to build. Now, as for, as for that future, um, I think the second half of the question was about how we combine cultivated fat with plant-based protein. Um, textured plant-based protein is incredibly good at um, mimicking the texture of muscle um, and muscle contributes primarily texture and bulk, not taste to meat. Um, but there are lots of ways, really incredible ways that um, our colleagues in plant-based meat companies are learning how to texture plant protein. Everything from um, uh, ultra high moisture extrusion uh, to 3D printing, um, electro spinning, all kinds of cool things. Um, and we're working on different strategies uh, with those customers for incorporating our cultivated fat into the finished product. It's really a case of um, deciding which of the many options is the best rather than having to invent new options as well. That was fantastic. Well, Max, uh, this is really exciting and best of luck with your work. I think we are now running out of time for Q&A. So thanks and good luck. And we will just be pushing everything by five minutes. So don't worry. Um, Phytoform is getting its share of time and uh, Q and A's. So I would thanks very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Max. It was great. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Phytoform to come up, share the screen, and start talking about what you're doing. Amazing. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm Will, co-founder of Phytoform Labs. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah, all is great. Perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and yeah, just so I would come uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, and also some of the learnings from our journey uh, as well. Um, so yeah, so as I said, Will, I'm co-founder of Fight Form. 
uh, and basically we're focusing on building the next generation of crops. Uh, so the reason that we're all here today is uh, obviously about how bad agriculture is for the environment. Uh, there are so many figures for it, but basically, you know, 10 to 10 to 20% of greenhouse gas emissions globally are from agriculture and it's wiped out countless ecosystems. Uh, and on top of this, uh, we actually need to increase our agricultural uh, output so that we can continue to feed our growing population. Uh, and so at Phytoform, we believe that crops, which are the common denominator across the entire food supply chain, uh, are the solution to this. Uh, and so our vision is to radically reduce the agricultural, uh, the impact of agriculture on the environment. Uh, and at the same time, actually improve uh, how improve how good crops are for the consumer. Uh, to achieve this, we're building a platform uh, that develops new traits and implements them across a wide range of species. Uh, so actually, when we started this journey with my co-founder, Nick, uh, we're both PhDs at Imperial. We focused on uh, genome editing as the way to implement traits, uh, because that was our experience from our PhDs. Uh, in tandem with developing that technology, we actually explored uh, the industry as well, the agricultural industry. Uh, and we came to quite a, uh, a serious realization that actually genome editing on its own is, is not enough. Uh, it's not enough just to deliver or reuse traits that have previously been discovered. Actually, we really need to develop new traits to solve both, both old and new problems. Um, and so that was kind of our first learning. Uh, and so that led us to develop uh, two, two components to our, our platform. Uh, the first component is a trait discovery technology. Uh, and so we use machine learning to uh, understand vast genetic data sets as we're capable of producing now. Uh, we then, that, that algorithm then suggests new traits. Um, and with our technology, those traits uh, cause the most minimal disruption possible to the native DNA. And that's kind of key. Uh, once we've optimized those traits, we then implement them using our genome editing technology efficiently and rapidly uh, into the crops. And this means that we can compress uh, the discovery, development, and implementation, implementation times from uh, decades, which was previously uh, down to months. So to make our dream a reality, uh, we've assembled uh, a core team of brilliant uh, multidisciplinary scientists um, who, who are you know, working uh, hard on the, on the project uh, and doing fantastically well. Uh, and obviously they're uh, incredibly important for the development of the company. Uh, but one of our second learnings was uh, that actually the advisory team are also equally as important. Um, and so finding building relationships with the right advisors is really key for, for uh, any company's development. Um, and so, you know, for instance, we've got Joe, who's a professor of potato economics, uh, which is fairly niche. Um, but due to his network, you know, we secured our second partnership uh, and we've got another one in the pipeline. Uh, and Hannah has uh, experience building, commercializing products uh, and Brad, our, our uh, regulatory advisor knows more than anybody probably should about the US regulatory system. And they've all been crucial in, in our development. Uh, and so obviously we wanted to focus uh, on reducing the impact of, of agriculture. Uh, and actually we found the easiest, or well not the easiest, but one of the uh, most obvious ways to do this is by reducing waste. Uh, but, uh, alongside that, we also have to take into account other things as we develop these projects. Uh, and so one of our, our sort of final learning that I'll leave you with um, was that we realized that uh, in the short term, we needed to demonstrate to the industry that we weren't just a research company, but that uh, we were actually producing uh, real solutions to, to problems and making an impact. Uh, and at the same time, we had to balance that obviously with our longer term value. Um, both economically and, and environmentally. Uh, and so that's led us to develop two different business models. Uh, the first one is where we develop single individual traits uh, with partners established in the industry. Uh, so for, for instance, like our potato uh, and tomato examples. 
The benefits of this are obviously we have a clear route to market, um, but uh, we also uh, you know, can make a real impact with those traits quicker uh, than maybe with other projects. The drawback is obviously we retain a smaller value of that overall market. So that led us, that was kind of the short term, short term fix for demonstrating to the industry that we're serious about what we're doing. Uh, and then the second model is where we actually develop our own crop varieties. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because it gives us the flexibility to work on maybe less conventional crops um, and really build crops for uh, the use case rather than just taking what's already there and, and running with it. Um, and so in this model, we develop our own crop varieties. We partner um, with people slightly further up the supply chain. This means that we'll capture a lot more of the value, impacts uh, the industry environmentally a lot more as well. But then obviously that comes with the challenge of um, uh, commercializing these. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, as, as with all the others, we're also hiring. So if you're interested in the planty side, uh, then let us know. Next. Um, well, that was fascinating. Um, good to see another Imperial Adam. So uh, the first question we would have, I think, would be from Leo. So can Phytoform deliver FTO for crops engineered by gene editing, for example, license for CRISPR-Cas9 IP? Uh, yeah, that is uh, interesting. So, yeah, the Cas9 IP obviously dominates the genome editing landscape, but it's not the only tool on offer. Uh, and really, we've made our platform as agnostic to the tool that we use as possible. So, uh, at the moment, we're actually using a, a molecule called CRISPR MAD7, which actually does have freedom to operate, and we have a separate license uh, to that. Um, so we have a separate license for that, so we uh, we don't use the Cas9. Um, but yeah, it's it's a tricky landscape. Um, uh, and as I say, Cas9, you know, what it, although you it comes with a hefty license, it also has that ecosystem built around it. So it's it's yeah, we in the end we weighed up uh, the pros and cons and went for uh, the crispr mad 7 molecule. Uh, and yeah, so far we've run with it and it's uh, it's worked okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So the next question we would have, and that's not from Q&A, so I encourage you to ask, but would be, um, what can you do to help giants in the agricultural space to innovate? What are you doing that they are not? Yeah. Well, with our trade discovery, I think that's kind of uh, the particular area of focus for us that's kind of unique. Um, so with the way we, uh, we look at it is that it depends for all plants are different, but around 90 on average, around 90% of a plant genome is regulatory region. So it's not even coding uh, DNA. Uh, and that's what we focus on because we think that really uh, unlocks lots and lots of different traits uh, and kind of interesting traits, you know, like traits, um, not just single gene knockout traits, but a whole raft of, of, of different ones. So yeah, I guess that's kind of how we're innovating over um, bigger industry giants. Awesome. And I think we'll take one more from Joe. So what are current attitudes to GM crops looking like? So it seems, according to Joe, it seems that the society still isn't kind of ready for this. So what do you think about it? Uh, no, that is a good question. Very good question. Well, so the way that we do, the way that our process works uh, is that we're not technically considered a GMO in many countries. So the, the very word GMO has many definitions. Um, of course, what we do is technically a GMO in Europe, but not in the US, so it's kind of bizarre. Um, and I think the point of us uh, trying to make changes with the minimal, most minimal disruption possible and in a targeted way um, should alleviate some of the concerns that, that people have around this sort of technology. But at the same time, yeah, I'd be naive to say that there is no problem and it's going to go off without a hitch. But we're, we're optimistic that, that people's opinions are slowly changing uh, and with information and education, um, it will get better. Uh, and hopefully by delivering some plants that have a real world impact, um, we can persuade people of the value of this technology. Well, um, well, I think this was fascinating. So uh, thank you so much and best of luck um, in your on your journey to engineer better crops. No problem. Thank you. Awesome.
Great. So I think we have seen over, over the last over the last couple a couple of uh, minutes we have seen pretty fascinating um, showcase of startups that are all treating kind of different problems from different perspectives, but all of them related to sustainability. And let's have fingers crossed for them. So. Right now, we are going to have a five-minute break and then stay tuned for our next panel, which will be investors panel. And uh, we will basically just hang on with us and um, we'll get back to you soon.
Evening all, welcome, uh, welcome to this evening session. Uh, we have the investor panel uh, right now and we've collected a number of questions from uh, entrepreneurs and academics who are looking to spin out uh, synthetic biology businesses from the university. And we have a panel of experts and investors uh, who will be able to share their experiences and be able to shed some light on some of those questions. Uh, but before I go ahead, uh, uh, it'd be great to go around, uh, go around the table and get everyone to um, give a brief introduction to themselves. Um, so before I jump in, I can give you a quick introduction to me. I uh, am Uzma. I'm from Octopus Ventures. Uh, we're a, a seed series A fund that focuses on deep tech, health, uh, in fintech. I am leading their biotech life sciences efforts um, and before this I was an academic so my PhD is in the space of synthetic biology uh, and biophysics uh, so this is very relevant and super excited to see this uh, the synthetic biology space really take off in the last last four to five years and um, lots of innovation in the space as molecular biology is sort of advanced significantly. Um, so I'll start off with uh, asking asking the uh, panelists to introduce themselves. So uh, should we start with you, Tess? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm the biology team of Hummingbirds, uh, founder of Focus Tech Funds, and we experience in fresh high growth business models in technology to founders that are leveraging biology to solve world problems. As Dan mentioned before, so many founders end up partnering with new funds that push extremely hard early exits, which actually mean that many technologies are implemented in society. So we've explicitly from entrepreneurs and ex-entrepreneurs to make sure that we can provide patient capital, a third in your timeline, so that the founders we work with are actually able to realize their technology or it can actually reach the lives of people. So in on the technology side, we have three unicorns in our portfolio that are worth over 12 billion. And we recently sold peak games for 1.8 billion. In, and in the biological side, we invested in Kernel, which is an mRNA oncology uh, therapeutic, in billion to one, which is a non-invasive self-feed a screening for pregnant mothers. Uh, Glenn and Oliver at Basecamp, who you introduced to more half an hour ago. And we also did a recent play on coding RNA. So basically we come in early and we help founders build out the initial person team, which we believe is the founding DNA and the ultimate success of the company. And all that set in itself. Thanks, Tess. Uh, and next on my screen is Josh. So why don't you give a quick introduction to yourself? Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, first off, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Josh Moser. I'm a partner at Petrie. Uh, we are a formation stage venture firm, and we focus on companies at the intersection of biology and engineering. And I explicitly focus on our efforts in sustainability. And so for us, that could be food, ag, uh, materials, chemicals, carbon removal, um, basically any, any biology that's not being applied to human health. Um, and our model is, is we typically work with technical founders, uh, many of whom have come from academic settings and developed technologies there that are looking to extend the impact of the technology that they've developed by commercializing them in the real world. So uh, we usually work with entrepreneurs right around and sometimes even before uh, incorporation and we'll invest between two and $500,000 uh, to help them get going. We work intimately alongside the founders for about 12 months um, on you know, everything from technical strategy to commercial strategy, filing IP, building the team. Um, and it's our goal is within that 12 month period to get the company to a place where we can collectively go out and raise a pretty meaningful seed round. Um, and I guess the, the other thing I would highlight about Petri, um, in addition to the, to the model that I just described, I think the network that we co-founded Petri is, uh, with is pretty differentiated. Um, so we were fortunate enough to co-found Petri with um, some leading uh, folks in the, in, at this intersection of biology and engineering. So there's entrepreneurs like Rach Machete from Ginkgo, um, Emily LaPruce from Twist, Bernard Van Lundgren from General Mills and Beyond Meat, and academics like George Church, Chris Voigt, Pam Silver. Um, we're, you know, we're fortunate enough to have those folks within Petri and we try to get them involved within our 
uh, portfolio companies any way that we can. Um, and then quickly about myself, my background is in super early stage companies at this convergence of biology and sustainability. Um, one is a company called Phylogen, it was an, it's an environmental microbiome company. And then another where we were growing a sustainable food company where we were growing seaweed on land and tanks. Um, so this is, this is my jam. Um, and, and yeah, thanks again for having me guys. Thanks, Josh. Uh, and I think we'll move on to Hoon, if you can introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm June Axup. I'm Chief Science Officer and Partner at Indie Bio. Uh, Indie Bio is also a startup accelerator. We're based in San Francisco and also New York, although during the COVID times, we're doing a hybrid model of virtual plus also in person. Uh, we have laboratories in both those locations. And uh, We've invested in a hundred over 150 some companies um, now and at the earliest stage, uh, about half of them coming straight out of academia, PhDs, postdocs. Um, and uh, we our, th our thesis is around bio life sciences, but specifically basically anything related to human and planetary health. And so in the last couple of years, we've actually divided into 50 50 of that. So, um, you know, we oftentimes think of biotech as being for life sciences, but actually, or for planetary uh, human health, but um, there is a lot in sustainability, uh, like Josh mentioned too, like agriculture, food, um, et cetera. So we've definitely been looking at a lot of ways we can capture carbon into value, into concrete, into recycling plastics, um, all these different things. So uh, really excited to be here. Thank you, Hoon. Um, and finally, Seth. Yeah, hi, I'm Seth Bannon, uh, and I'm super excited to be on this panel in particular. Um, I, I've been working on issues like sustainability for a really long time. Uh, initially, uh, probably man, 15 years ago, through politics. So I, I uh, helped run campaigns for people like uh, Barack Obama and, and people running for Congress and Senate, and, um, and then became an entrepreneur. Uh, and through that process, realized that a lot of the problems that I cared about solving through politics, uh, like the climate crisis or malnutrition or disease, can actually be much better solved through technology entrepreneurship. Uh, and so for the last five years, uh, have been supporting largely PhD founders that are building companies that both have a path to a billion dollars a year in revenue and a path to massive positive social or environmental impact. Um, uh, the fund is called 50 Years and we, we, we back scientists at the pre-seed and seed stage. And then um, our jam is to help great scientists become great entrepreneurs. That's kind of what we love to do. Uh, and in particular, in the sort of synthetic biology meets sustainability space, we've actually uh, we're supporting 11 companies that are sort of directly in that in that space and then and then that's companies everything from memphis meats uh, which is growing real meat without animals to uh, solugen which is enzymatically making industrial chemicals to geltor which is we're commonly making collagen and gelatin uh, to some self companies um, we have one that we just backed which we're really excited about that is using metabolic engineering to replace a lot of the cooking oils um, that we typically raise forests uh, to, to raise. And we're also backing for platform sustainability companies. So these are companies like OpenTrons that though they are not directly making sustainable products, they help all those other companies that I talked about move faster and smarter. So super excited for the discussion today. Amazing, thank you all. Impressive backgrounds and obviously quite active, quite active in the space uh, with some significant investments uh, and many names that I've come across when I've looked at looked at the space. Um, so I think starting off with uh, an area where I know, you know, June alluded to in terms of, you know, within the space of agri tech and food tech, there is there is sort of a lot of examples to see be it cultured meat or, uh, you know, using carbon dioxide for production of single cell proteins, um, etc. So I think what our, our audience is quite keen on, uh, on hearing from from the investors and the panelists is the sort of around the white space in in the engineering biology specifically within the sustainability space and what is it that that you are looking for and what areas are you sort of spending a lot of time in so i think i'll start off just to make this easy we'll start off with seth why don't you get why yeah sure yeah so um I think the space you mentioned is still very, very interesting and still at the very early innings. Um, so, you know, humans um, began domesticating animals, goats, I think, uh, in Mesopotamia 10,000 years ago. Uh, and though the scale of it all has changed, the basic sort of process hasn't, right? We raise animals with traits that we like, 
uh, we we feed them for years, we 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 tend to their medical condition, and then uh, we we kill them and cut them up, and and then we put what we what we get from them into food or other sort of products. Uh, this is a very old and and quite inefficient production technology, uh, and it's also incredibly environmentally destructive. Animal agriculture contributes more to greenhouse gas emissions than all of transportation combined. Um, and, and so while there has been a lot of activity in this space, uh, there's still so much potential there, right? So one rule of thumbs that, that VCs often use is that a market should be a billion dollars a year at least in order for it to be venture scale. Th there's this uh, type of meat called chuck. Chuck is uh, meat from the shoulder of a cow. Uh, the market for chuck in the United States is $6 billion a year. Right? So you have one piece of one type of animal in one country is $6 billion a year. The global meat market is probably $2 trillion a year. And there's all the other products that come from animals. Um, and so while there has been a lot of activity in this space, we expect that there's going to be even more area for innovation. Um, and there's likely opportunity for five, six, seven hundred billion dollar companies just in the space of using biology to replace all of the products that we get from animals. And so the way we think about it is you have the animal agriculture stack, right? Uh, animals basically used as a production stack to make uh, many, many products that go into many, many things. We think every single one of those products uh, over the next 10, 20 years is going to be replaced uh, by companies that are that are using either biological means to, to make those same products or or through plant-based or mycelium-based pro uh, products. And so we think that there's still a ton of white space there, though it's um, though it's a space that has seen a lot of activity. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right there. I, I kind of like agree with that. I think a lot of these companies are still very early and we don't know if the first wave of wave of companies, uh, you know, how far they will take this innovation and whether there'll be a second wave of companies that that, you know, look at other areas or other other bottlenecks. For example, in the cultured meat space alone, we're starting to see like horizontal uh, tech companies come in just as you know there's there's enough uh, cultured meat companies out there so whether be it growth factors or bioreactors uh, just seeing horizontal tech companies trying to uh, trying to make those parts of the or address those bottlenecks what are, what are your thoughts Tess? Hi uh, so I'm I'm gonna turn my video off because I got a lot of messages from people that I was breaking up before um, so that's going to be turned off. Um, yeah, so I guess there's a lot of white space. If I have to boil it down to two particular areas that I'm that I'm most excited about, one would definitely be to uh, improve our functional understanding of microbial dark matter. So identifying new biomolecules that can build greener industrial, agricultural, and material processes. What do I mean with this? Just to clarify that a little bit, uh, Basecamp touched on this before. So their metagenomic sequencing is kind of a first move in this space, but I think there's a lot of untapped potential for further uh, functional characterization. So new tools to actually functionally characterize at sites and also different approaches. We actually cannot culture a lot of these bacteria. So let's, uh, I mean, I'm saying bacteria, but microbes in general, a lot of them have not been cultured in laboratory conditions and the way that they actually exist in, in these endogenous environments is that they're in these microbial communities, which are extremely complex. And the second you try to take them out and purify it, you actually miss a lot of the cell to cell interactions that have the value um, that we need. So finding a way to either, I guess, optimize the, the, the culture conditions using computational tools or finding a way to uh, leverage the power of microbial communities to perform, let's say, multi-step industrial functions, I think will be a big area that, that we'll see a lot of movement in. On the second space, uh, this is completely different, but that is actually a consumer biodesign brand. So at the moment, we're seeing a lot of these biotech plays build B2B solutions, right? But if our goal is to ultimately change society away from large-scale farming and petroleum-based chemicals, then why not change the behavior of consumers directly? and shape our consumption towards a more sustainable direction. So I guess in the ethos of Adam Smith Division of Labor, what we're going to see companies kind of specialize into different spaces. So in this particular uh, case, I'd be thinking about an asset light uh, consumer portfolio company where the core focus is working with these biotech companies and, and using their chemicals. Let's say there's one company that's producing animal based or uh, sorry, animal free proteins that would usually be derived from animals. And then there's another company that's doing high value chemicals uh, from, from glucose. Um, it's, it's working with these existing biotech companies and really building out a consumer facing portfolio 
um, and, and brand and being specialized in that. And that's something I haven't seen done at scale yet, uh, but I think there's a lot of room for that. Yeah, no, I, uh, I agree. What about, uh, we'll be keen to get your thoughts on this June as well. Um, I think Seth and Tessa both uh, brought up some really interesting points, especially around, if you think about sustainability, it's really about human harmony with the earth, right? And, um, and as humans, we have this massive technology to be able to make technology uh, and, and essentially change the environment and evolutionary pressures as we so choose, but can we do it in a more conscious way that we're not damaging other organisms? We're um, obviously living in a symbiotic space with all the microorganisms as well. And so um, how, do, how do we extract value for of things that we need and want uh, without damaging the entire earth. Um, so I think a lot of the areas that IndieBio is looking at right now, um, you know, we, we had worked a lot in, in the um, agriculture space and food production space, uh, but also thinking about how do we recycle waste into value um, and uh, taking CO2 into value, plastics into value. So a lot of these um, these questions of how, do we, how can we live more harmoniously with um, our earth and and use the technology to make sure that everything on earth, both the air and the water and all the other organisms are, um, are kept healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, agree with, with the thoughts of, uh, of the panel. Just with the view of time, I'm going to move on to the next question and we'll start with you, Josh, on, on, on this one. Uh, and this is more around, you know, sort of, I guess, challenges and hurdles of, uh, of, of startups in this space and you know the typical hurdles that they face especially given that this is this is quite a new area it's R&D sort of like heavy and therefore you know requires a significant amount of capital to you know get the get this to a place where you've got something that's commercial and and actually out in the market so mm -hmm. I'd be keen to understand, I guess, from your view and the businesses that you're seeing, what kind of hurdles and challenges are these businesses facing or spin outs? Yeah, I'm happy to. I think, I mean, my my mental model for this is that companies fail when they run out of cash. Um, companies run out of cash usually when there's no clear why now. And so if I kind of had to bucket the three uh, different types of pitfalls, I would I would kind of think about it as, no market, not the right team, or not the right tech. Um, so on the market, um, uh, Bill Brady, who's a co-founder of Petri and who spoke earlier, I believe, uh, he's currently running a company called Kula Bio, has a great uh, has a great quote on this, which he calls a zinger. Um, but he he says to put the customer in the center of the company extremely early, and I think that that's crucial, especially for um, heavily R and D focused companies like the ones that I think we're all typically working with. Um, a lot of, I think the, the bias can be for technical founders um, is to just build something and, and they will come. Um, but we believe that, you know, you, there's some insights um, that can be incredibly mundane or incredibly profound that will only come from talking to customers extremely early. And the best way to know whether you found a market, I think, in the early days is to actually get them to part with capital. If they're willing to pay for some sort of R&D, um, you know that there's actually a, a burning need there. Um, so I think you can use those to, to help alleviate any, any hurdles there. Um, I think from a team standpoint, uh, the team just has to be exceptional, um, both from a technology perspective and a, a market perspective. Um, I think with, with technical founders in particular, uh, another issue that we tend to see is that people tend to underestimate how difficult it is to fundraise. And I think ultimately the CEO needs to love fundraising because they're going to be doing it a lot. Um, and that can be uh, a very different skill set than uh, you know, doing a PhD or postdoc program. And then the last on technology, um, you know, there's lots of interesting technology out there, but I think ultimately unit economics and scalability are what determine who the winners are in a given space. And um, again, I think really early on, it's important to try to solve for some of those things, try to answer as many of those questions as you can so that you know um, that when you are ready to, to, you know, for the big time and can turn on production of whatever it is that you're making, that you actually have the, the technical capabilities to do so. So I'd say those are the three kind of general areas that, that I think about in terms of hurdles and pitfalls. Um, yeah. Thanks, Josh. No, definitely. And I think one that I, I think 
quite a lot about is, you know, sort of getting these uh, academic entrepreneurs to start engaging with the market sooner. But I think getting that timing right is crucial because you don't want to go knocking on the doors of, of you know, these fine chemical manufacturers when you might, you know, not have sufficient data and sufficient sort of development. And then they don't take you seriously when you're going knocking on their door again. But at the same time, uh, it's important to understand what they care for. And often enough, that lens is, is, is you know, paramount rather than building something out, uh, building something out and then finding that actually your customers care more about the price or care more about these unique economics. Uh, so totally agree. And, and uh, June, I guess, obviously, at IndieBio, lots of early stage companies, you must sort of like have so much visibility over the typical challenges and the typical sort of hurdles that they face. Yeah, and I agree with Josh and what you said as well. And I think that those are some of the, the main categories. I think I just wanted to add a little bit on the, entre uh, the scientist to entrepreneur mindset shift. Um, and, and that is similar to what you guys were talking about of like going out there and, and going to talk to customers, finding the problems. Um, I do also think the scalability is, especially in sustainability is one of the biggest problems because, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to create something that's a commodity product that is, you know, cents on the dollar right now. So how do you actually scale to, to, to actually fulfill that, um, that dream and also the capital costs involved a lot of these, especially in fermentation wise, you'll need plants and whether is it a drop something that you can drop in to use or do you have to build your own plants that those become like really big questions um, when you think about the viability of, of the company. So um, I think it's easy as, as scientists you know we're so familiar with our lab and everything is just in our lab but um, as soon as you take it out the outside the lab is when you're going to start getting the real feedback in the world as to uh, you know do people actually like this does it actually work in real life uh, what are all the other systems that you might not even be thinking about that you might not even have control over so um, getting those answers as soon as possible and letting them don't use them as roadblocks but as problems to guide you in in your problem solving. Yeah, and I guess moving on to Seth, then how do you how as a board member or as a as a investor or as a mentor of a business, how do you help these you know academic uh, and technical founders build this sort of commercial lens and start thinking more like you know from from that perspective of you know scalability? Does it integrate in with customers? Would it? scale at a cost that would you know I guess uh pay off so how, how do you think about that yeah so first I'll say we uh we think the best way of helping founders uh is by building super trusted vulnerable relationships with them and therefore we don't take board seats uh because uh boards unlike helpful seed investors can fire founders and so there's always this weird dynamic uh uh so it's, uh, th that's why we're not on boards but um yeah, so I would say there's a, there's a there's a few there's a few um, ways that you can help. So one is 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 in, in touching off what's been said is just introducing some of the uh, the thinking around what this is going to look like at commercial scale from the beginning. I mean, one of the the words we use over and over and over again is techno-economics. Techno-economics. What are the techno-economics? Have you even done a back of the napkin math of the techno-economics, right? And all that means is you know you're taking all of the assumptions around uh, the cost at scale, everything from the facility you're gonna need to the energy to run that facility, to the labor to run that facility. You're calculating the, the rough uptime and downtime. And then you're saying what the capacity of that facility is gonna be in terms of output, how much you think you can sell that for. And does that math roughly add up? Or do you have to make an assumption that is just kind of unbelievable to think that you're gonna ever be able to sell this economically? Um, and so sort of interesting, that kind of rigorous thinking, and it doesn't mean you need to have that all figured out, right? But it should at least kind of make sense to a reasonable person. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, and the reason techno-economics, by the way, is really important is because, um, uh, Tess, you, you actually said something earlier, which I, 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 maybe I'm just misunderstanding, but you said, you know, uh, causing consumer behavior change. I don't believe in consumer behavior change. I think that consumers are stuck in their ways and they want to buy what they buy, even if they know it's unsustainable, they know it's unhealthy. And the reason I'm excited about bio companies is because there's an opportunity, especially consumer bio companies, to deliver basically the exact same products that they were using before, maybe even better, but in a way that takes away the sustainability concerns and takes away the health concerns, right? Um, we actually have something we call the Mr. Burns test, which is, you know, we want to see all these sustainability companies build a product that Mr. Burns, the character on The Simpsons, for those that don't know, he's like the proto uh, uh, greedy industrial capitalist who only cares about himself, 
We want to see a path to these companies building a product that Mr. Burns would buy, not because it's sustainable or healthy or, or good in any way, but because it's like the best thing he can get for the cheapest price. And so I think that's really important. And then the last thing I'll say on the, the sort of transition from PhD to founder, and this is the most important, is founders, PhD founders have to completely change the way they communicate. In academia, the type of communication that's prized is data, 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 data. And then here's the five different ways my data might be wrong. Right. And that's that's good in, in academia. That's how you communicate well. That's how you get ahead. Um, if you communicate that way as a founder, your customers' eyes will glaze over, your investors' eyes will glaze over, the press's eyes will glaze over. And in fact, there's some science to support this. So there was a really interesting study done that looked at philanthropic giving. And, and the particular cause they looked at was uh, malnutrition in the developing world. Uh, and they, uh, they, pit, they, they made the same pitch to ask people to donate, but they made it in three different ways. Way number one was just the data. There's this many kids that are mal mal malnourished, this many die per year. Uh, this is how far a dollar can go. You can save this many lives with your donation. It was just a very compelling fact-based like thing that showed this, this nonprofit is really, really important. The second uh, pitch was just the story of a kid who was malnourished and died and how much his mother suffered. That was it. And then it said, can you please give money? And the third was that story plus the data. The second narrative outperformed by far. It was even better. Just the story was even better than the story plus the data. And so I think there's this unlearning process where academics and PhDs need to need to need to drop a lot of the habits that actually made them a great researcher so that they can then grow into becoming a great founder. Agreed. Absolutely agreed, Seth. And I think that's one of the key takeaway points I would like, uh, you know, founders or uh, aspiring uh, academic founders to take away from this is that uh, stories are very powerful. So as an academic, you can get trained to deliver data and to, you know, sort of like present data and it becomes very formulaic. Uh, and I feel that um, I think stories are a lot more powerful. So if you can tell a story and you can tell your journey and, you know, I, I guess why, why anyone should care, or why this is interesting for the customer, or why this is inter interesting for the consumer, it um, sort of really sticks. So I think... Uh, as well, I think investors and mentors can help businesses or academic founders by helping them with their pitching processes. This nicely segues into our next uh, area, which was around, you know, now that we've spoken a bit about supporting these early academic founders, is how do you see this team evolve as the business goes from C to Series A? And what is the role of the role of the founder? And I know that June touched slightly on sort of like, you know, you go CEO, when do you go from like an academic founder who shoulders a lot of what a CEO does and to a point where you might need a more professional CEO to come into the business and how does that change the dynamics and you know how does the or how does the role of the founder evolve so it'd be great to get your thoughts on this Tess uh, and how how you handle this because obviously this is something that I bump into quite regularly as a as a biotech life sciences slash deep tech investor. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I, I think so at Hummingbird, because we're focused on the, the founders and the entrepreneurs, we would be backing that from the start. So ideally, we'd be backing someone that's ideologically driven and that is completely obsessed with the problem that they're solving and willing to drive it through all the way to the end. And, and so it's not the technology that we're investing in, uh, but rather we, we'd want to see the founder really playing this main role throughout the life of the company rather than kind of artificially plugging someone else in later down the line and, and completely changing the dynamic. So with that being said, I guess there's two phases, right? So at Seed, it's like you're you're within a very small ideologically vision-driven founding team that's setting up the venture in a scrappy fashion. Um, and everyone's kind of being bound by by this, this larger dream or goal. Um, and then you really use that time to validate these technical assumptions and show or benchmark that, that your technology is able to be better than the whatever the benchmark that's out there on the market. By series A, at this stage, the tech would be validate, validated at least to a minimal extent. So proving that it's better than existing standards. And I guess at, this is the point where you could use that data as a leverage to hire a stellar team on board. So uh, the best founders that we've worked with spend over 40% of their time hiring around series A, post series A. And I guess you could, within a, tech, within a, a biotech company, you could start thinking about hiring people that might not be from traditional biotech backgrounds. So rather hire a product or a talent, not a scientist, but maybe let team at the 
and really bring in kind of that tech scaling. So preferably they'd be people that have already scaled uh, as be from a size of eight or four to a hundred before. Uh, so bringing on people that are able to ha have that growth mindset and take the company to the next stage. But yeah, I, I guess the main focus is just the founder is someone that, that we would be backing all the way throughout. Yeah, absolutely. And often, often the founders will, you know, sort of take uh, a CTO or a CSO kind of like role, which is still very significant involvement in shaping the business and moving the business forward and the strategic, uh, I guess, planning around the business. So I, I you know, you're, you're still very much involved, maybe in a slightly, slightly different role. But I guess, I guess another area that I do think about is looking at, you know, biotech investors or rockstar biotech investors that have been there, done that, scaled companies from, you know, that sort of C series A, series B stage onwards. And, you know, how do you attract that talent? And what does that talent pool look like in, in, in the UK, in Europe today? And, you know, do we need to go to the US to look for this? So quite keen to, um, quite keen to get, get on this June. So you're cutting out a little bit, but I, I think I got the gist. Um, you know, our, our companies are still really early and definitely some of them, as they have gone to Series A, um, have maybe shifted and, and brought in more um, senior folks. Um, I think it, it always kind of depends on, you know, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of senior folks have um have so much experience um, and, and have worked in probably like bigger companies before that they're oftentimes at a stage in their career that they actually want to take some risk. They maybe like want to, you know, shake things up or, or try something new or using their experience um, to help uh, help new technologies come to light. So there actually is, you know, I think quite a pool of of people who are kind of searching for that that new that new innovation and new um, startup build. Um, obviously, cer certain areas um, and certain ecosystems are a little bit um, more prevalent for that, such as Silicon Valley. Um, just because the mindset here, everybody is interested in, in thinking about how to start new companies. Um, I think that's something that like this is an ecosystem thing there and the fact that you guys are putting this on for the UK is is amazing because I think there's there is more and more of that conversation and that will just kind of snowball into um, bringing you know more investors more senior people and and um, and building that ecosystem and building that trust between people. Yeah agreed. Um... And Josh, I'm keen to get your thoughts on sort of like, you know, the evolution of the team uh, and the role of the founder. Yeah, I think um, I can give some specific thoughts as having gone, you know, seen a, a, a biology company go from uh, very early days with a handful of, of folks to uh, 25 plus people. And then I can also just give some general thoughts. Um, uh, specifically, I think the most interesting thing I observed going from, say, five to 20 people was um, at the beginning, we were all generalists. We were all kind of doing a million things. And at some point, that that uh, methodology just breaks and you have to establish teams. And what's really interesting is when you establish teams is that uh, there can become, there, there can form this sort of hierarchy um, and teams have to have different responsibilities and roles. Um, and that can, I think, be difficult for founders who are used to having really uh, intense control over every part of the company. So um, at some point, and I think it's usually between 10 and 15 people, you generally have teams and that could be you know, an R&D team, a scalability team, a business development team, a sales team, a operations team, whatever it is, but you will have to formalize teams at some point. Um, the other general comment I'll say, and um, I've had the, the pleasure of hearing Emily LaProuste from Twist talk about this many times over, um, but her philosophy with kind of building large teams is uh, using uh, what's called servant leadership. And it's, you know, her, her the way that she communicates is, is um, you basically take that typical pyramid, um, the hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical pyramid with the CEO at the top, and you flip that upside down. And so ultimately the CEO works for everybody else, not the other way around. Um, and so the CEO works for their execs by setting the strategy, their execs work for their management by setting the tactics, and ultimately what you have is a CEO that's supporting everybody. And I think the best founders, the best scientists turned founders will embody that at some point throughout their, um, their tenure as CEO, being able to lose, you know, give up control, 
um, support the rest of the organization. And um, as somebody mentioned earlier, ultimately people just spend a lot of time on hiring. And so uh, uh, founders and CEOs tend to spend you know, most of their time on three things in the end state, raising capital, hiring, and managing the team and setting the overall strategy. Um, and so I think you know you have to get from a point of starting doing everything to the end state of doing just those three things or mainly those three things. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think hiring uh, is key, especially at such early stages where every every single member on the team is sort of like instrumental in building the business. Um, so totally agree with with you there. And how about you, Seth? Any thoughts on on this? Yes, uh, we we actually have stickers. Normally, I have them around me. I don't have one now, but they, they, they say a PhD CEO FTW, uh, FTW meaning for the win. Uh, and so I, I think Tess, exactly what you said, super super line. You know, I, the, the the old model of biotech was you would have a a, a basket of uh, small molecules or maybe gene therapies or whatever, right? And and you wanted to take those that basket through FDA approval, and they either got approved and the company was worth a lot, or they didn't and the company was worth nothing. And it's interesting in that for that type of biotech company, there's a playbook that you can run, right? And that playbook's been run over and over again. There's not really creative problem solving that's necessary. And for that type of a biotech company, it kind of makes sense to maybe just like hire an experience management team that's just run that playbook over and over again because there, there's no, there's no, nothing creative. But for this new type of bio company, especially bio meat sustainability or the platform therapeutics companies or all the sort of new new bio companies that we're seeing. There is no playbook, right? Which means there's there's creative problem solving that's necessary, like day in and day out. And in any company where there's creative problem solving necessary, it's much much better if the founders are running the company, because it is much much easier to teach a deeply innovative person how to be a great business leader than it is how to teach a great business leader how to be a deeply innovative person. And in fact, we saw we saw this already in in software, right? In the '90s, the way it worked is the nerds who were the developers would build something of value, and the VCs would come in and they would hire a man, and it was always a man to like run the company. It'd be some gray-haired Harvard MBA, uh, and that was how it worked. And then at some point, the nerds were like, "No, I don't want to. I don't want to, uh, you know, hire a CEO. I want to be the CEO." And it turns out that if they if they put in the work to to learn to become great CEOs, those companies do way way better. And literally every big you know, if you, if you run through the top 10 market cap companies that are technology companies, they were all run by their technical uh, founders for a very, very, very long time. And so we think that it's it's high time that that kind of model comes to comes to bio. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I think as a PhD as well, you have the skill of learning. So that to that point of like creating these innovations or, you know, leading these innovations in the space, you probably pick up and learn how to how to be a great, great CEO which differs, I guess, for different companies, whether the company's in a good time or a bad time and um, et cetera. So absolutely, thanks so much for all your thoughts. And I think given, uh, I guess, in, in view of the time, uh, we should round this up. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to thank all the uh, investors and the panelists who have joined today and have given um, given their time uh, up to to answer some of the some of the questions that we often run into with academics that are looking to spin out businesses in this space, and hopefully we look forward to hearing from uh, from from a bunch of you both in terms of any advice or investment opportunities or mentoring opportunities. Please do reach out, um, and I'm sure that um, the details of the investors will be shared through email separately. Great, thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks. Thanks very much. I will let Miro now take over. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Tess. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. I think that what we have seen over the last uh, couple of hours, actually, was a great showcase of how people at kind of different places and at different position and with different perspectives are trying to address the issues with sustainability. But one thing is common for all of us and we are trying to do this through synthetic biology and whether we are an academic front uh, or are running a startup or are investing and supporting such initiatives, I think that all of us have a place in such ecosystem. So um, I just really hope that um, this will encourage everyone to um, think a bit more and a bit deeper about how to use biology to solve environmental problems. And I think that uh, 
June has said this beautifully to improve the health of our planet. And um, I think that we'll be looking forward to um, have you joining us for the future events. Um, and uh, please do, please do um, follow us on social media, uh, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, so many, many thanks uh, on behalf of Oxford University, Synthetic Biology Society, and on behalf of uh, uh, Hummingbird Ventures. And we are really, really grateful that you join us tonight. And many thanks to all the speakers uh, for your time, for joining. It was quite a job to coordinate everybody and everything um, in a couple of hours. And I would say especially many thanks to Tess, uh, who has done a great job coordinating all of this. And many thanks to Corina, who who was our, um, our, I would say, main tech guru for tonight. So really thank you everybody and have a great evening, morning, depending where you are and stay safe.